So we are in week one of our new series entitled Sex God, where we basically look at the concept of the God that we serve, the one that we put in church buildings with stained glass, with all these this pomp and circumstance and the papacy, and even back, uh, all the way back to like our uh, Catholic heritage, right? He's very uh, prim and proper, and yet this thing that he created for people to procreate was also created for people to recreate. And it's sex. And so this very prim and proper God, it seems throughout history that there's been a disconnect between the God who made things, who's there for forgiveness, and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like people figured out sex on their own, right? What we don't connect is that that same God who we put in chapels and in stained glass is the one who made, initiated, and commanded us to have sex. Not just to have good sex, but to have the best sex possible. And he also gives us the method by which to do that. Now, I'm going to make a bet that in this room, every last one of us knows what sex is not. You know what sex is not because we found out what sex is supposed to be from culture, from movies. You've seen 300 movies with sex scenes in it. You've seen 100 different, you have 100 different friends who've told you this and that about sex. And so we have this hodgepodge of things that the world is calling sex. And a God who says, listen, this is real sex. This is the sex the way that I made it. Yes, it's rated X. Yes, it's, in, it's personal. Yes, it's intimate. But all these other people who are saying sex is or isn't this, if they don't know sex through Christ and what He has commanded us to do, they don't really know it. They've, they've, they've committed a kind of perverted version of what it's supposed to be. Not perverted in that it's, uh, disgusting or gross, but it's just not what it's, it's not complete. It's like this model, tiny model version of what this great sex is supposed to be. So, in this series, week one, what we're going to talk about is God's design of sex. The creator, the one who makes the whole world spin and float. Also said, I have given mankind a wedding gift. So we're going to see what his purpose was for it. Now we ask everyone in this room, everyone can come up with, with what sex is not. Very few of us know what sex actually is and what it was meant to be. So today, we are going to try to basically push the default button, reset the default button on our brains as far as what we know about sex, and go, okay, God, you tell me what it is. And it's not going to be flowery, and it's not going to be tame. It's going to be dangerous. But God's view of sex is that way. It's intense. It's intimate. It's passionate. And it's not rated PG or PG-13, okay? So don't get this idea that God's version of sex is this gentle, flowery, blah, 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 blah. And the world's version of sex is like the actual hot, steamy, passionate sex. It's not, that's not the way that it is. But with our intonation of sex, let's reset. It's like a whiteboard. Everyone has written on your whiteboard what sex is. We're just going to take a big cloth. But yeah, whiteboard needs cloth, right? Good. Eraser, and we're just going to erase all of it and go, okay, we're back to square one. What do we do? All right? So, I'm going to give you four things. The four things that sex was made for. We're going to start in the book of Genesis. That's the first book of the Bible. It literally means the beginning. So, Genesis chapter 2. When I say 2, I mean 1. Sometimes I stutter. Genesis chapter 1. This is, if you guys are newer to church, this is the story of creation as we know it. Not some homiletical, out there, old guy who told a story just so that he could appease children. We believe that this account of Genesis is the way the world was created. All right. Now, some people believe it was like 6,000 years ago. Some people, like me, believe these events were set in motion 13.4 billion years ago. And at the same time, you can still I'm still a Christian just alongside those who believe that the world is young. That is no more than 10,000 years old. And we'll talk about why that is in our next series called M12. It's going to look at the apologetics of Christianity. So, but instead of going into that and opening that can of worms, we will let that can of worms sit there. Also, who has a can of worms? When did that become a, a what, what an adage? A can of worms. What does can of worms even mean? One question. If you don't bring a can of worms, you bring a little thing with mer it doesn't. It's not under there. So, chapter one, beginning verse twenty-eight. So, we are going to see God's first command to people, and obviously, what it's probably what do not murder, uh, do not commit adultery, do not, do not, do not. Right? Here's his first command to people. 
<laughs> Bless you, Lord, holy. Says this. Uh, verse 26. Then God said, this is the sixth day. Then God said, let us make man in our image. So, a couple things. First of all, mankind. Second of all, our, there's more than one. Not because it, we're polytheistic, but we're monotheistic. But we have one God in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was not born after the Son, and the Son wasn't born after the Father. He was, they were all there at the beginning of time. There is not a separation insofar as their power or their timeline. They are all infinite. Right? So, God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are sitting there, and they collectively go, let us, that's why that plural is there, make man in our own image. Now, when it says image, it doesn't mean that we all look like what God looks like. First of all, because God doesn't have physical appearance. He is spirit. He is uh, without form. That is God. So, we can't have form and look like God physically. Also, we can't look like God, all of us, because I don't look like Hunter. So, if I don't look like Hunter and we're both made in God's image, obviously what it's saying is not that we all look like God. What it means to be made in God's image is we are made in His likeness, in His character, in His personification. All those different things that we look at with God, we carry His attributes. Okay, we're going to look at that here in a second. Uh, verse 20, continue verse 26. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the ground, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Okay, so we're giving dominion over animals, not to abuse, use however we want, but instead that we would steward them. That they being less helpful of themselves, we would become helpful in their place. Okay? Steward them well. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So right there we see he makes man and woman in his image. So he doesn't make man in his image and then woman in the image of something else. They're both in his image, meaning his likeness. God blessed them and said to them, Here's his first command. It isn't don't eat from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not don't commit adultery. It's not don't have fun on the weekends. His first command to people is this. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Now, this is before Adam and Eve sinned. So this is before the fall. This means that... Is something buzzing? Good. See, I always check that because I don't know if I'm crazy. So I'm waiting for that day where I'm like... Can anyone hear that pelican? And everyone's like, uh-oh. <laughs> it's time to retire. Good. i got one more day in me at least. All right. Be fruitful and increase in number. Now, uh, before the fall, we didn't have kids a different way than we have kids now. All right? So when he says be fruitful and multiply, he's not saying, now, you cut off your arm, plant it in the ground, and that's going to make another baby. Okay? This is God's first command to people. He says, go have sex. I made that for a reason. I made that for a reason. They join easily for a reason. And that is because I want you to use them that way. God wasn't shocked by this, right? He wasn't looking down on man and woman. And they started putting things in other people's things. And he wasn't like, no, no. What are you doing? That's not meant for that. You're supposed to cut up your arm and plant it. Right? He wasn't like, no, you're supposed to just spit on their mm -hmm. left shoulder. And that's what makes, no. He meant for it to happen. He meant for the arousal of both to create a system in which they can join together in mutual satisfaction and passion and orgasm and create more. This is God's design. Okay? It wasn't after the fall God was like, oh no, now I need to give them something to do. No, they were having sex before <laughs> sin entered the world. Sex was always a part of the plan. Okay? Which is cool to know about our God. <laughs> He invented it. That's awesome. Rule of the fish of the sea and the bird of the air over every living creature that moves along the ground. Okay? This is the command that he gives to people. So, the first thing that uh, sex is for, point number one, is procreation. Okay? Procreation. To make more of us. This is a part of what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, are sitting in space... Okay, they are, it's before time. They are up in their own dwelling place. And guess what they want to do? They want to create. So they create the heavens and the earth. He speaks light into existence. He has known every hair on your head. And he has spoken you into existence. And he's breathed into the nostrils of mankind from the beginning to today. The nefesh hayah, the ruach, the breath of God. That is what we now inherit. 
God said, I did this not because it is lamenting or tormenting for me, but because I love to do it. So he says, guess what, mankind? Since you are like me and made in my likeness, guess what people like to do? We like to make crap. Okay? So from creativity to reproduction, we love it. One of the happiest days, scratch it, the happiest day of my life was the first time I ever saw my son. Okay? It, it, for, first it trips you the heck out because you're like, whoa, how the heck? No, what? For some reason, for nine months, you think to yourself that you're lying to everyone that you meet. Because you're not going to have a baby. But you're like, we're not going to have a baby. This, that doesn't work that way. Okay? But I did. And then it comes out and you're like, you're a person. Whoa, the frick, you're a tiny little smelly right now person. Like, why are you so wet? Right? But you hold him, and in that moment you go, why do I love this so much? Why do I love my kid so much? Why do I love to recreate so much? Oh, that's right, because my dad loves his kids so much. My father in heaven loves to create so much. And when he created me, part of his breath rubbed off on me, and the echo of the Almighty in me is I like what he likes. And if I'm taking after his spirit and his soul, I should also hate the things that he hates. You go, well, God doesn't hate anything. That's a lie. Okay? The Bible is chock full of God saying, this is what I hate. This is what I despise. So I, as a man, you as a woman, should hate certain things. Okay? People getting abused or misused or mistreated, the poor and destitute, not being able to stand up for themselves. A woman gets hurt. A child is hit. These things should arouse something in us if we have God's Spirit. And we should get angry. Anger is not a sin. Okay? To, do, to get a angry righteously is part of what we're called to be as His people. That is part of the echo of the Almighty in us. So the first part of procreation is that the two become one flesh. Okay? So that's what it says in chapter 2. So if you your Bibles, uh, we are now in chapter 2 of Genesis. So chapter 1 gives us kind of a very, very direct list of what happened. Chapter 2, the writer is going to go back and go, okay, now I'm going to give you a detailed account that focuses mostly on mankind. Alright? It says this. Uh, it is not good for the man to be alone in verse 18. Chapter 2, verse 18. I will make a helper suitable for him. So when it says helper there, do not think of it as like Santa's little helper. Like Santa's the big dog and the little helper is the uh, poor, lesser version of Santa Claus. The word helper here is the same word that is used when God references the Holy Spirit later on in Scripture. So if you think that that word helper, as a guy or a girl, thinks that a helper or a woman is subject to man or underneath man, remember this. The Holy Spirit is called helper. And the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son are all three in the exact same, with the exact same authority. So if you think that that means that women are below man because they are their helper, then you must think that the Holy Spirit is below the Father and the Son because He is called helper. That is false. Okay? That is actually heresy. Okay? They are all one in the same. I will make a helper suitable for Him to be right alongside Him, made from His rib to go under His arm, not in front of Him to lead Him or behind Him to follow Him, but beside Him as cooperative. Okay? Close to the heart, under the arm. So men, we are called to be protector. We are called to protect the heart and also to cooperate with them. Verse 19. Now the Lord God formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. So now Adam is naming people. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed the place with flesh. The Lord God made Ish. Ah, which is the word for woman in Hebrew, Isha. He made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now, they can imagine, man wakes up, and he's now seen every animal on the planet, and he's gone, no suitable helper was found. And then he wakes up from his deep sleep, and he sees woman. He sees Isha. He sees Isha, for she was taken from Ish. Ish is man, Isha is woman. And he wakes up and he writes poetry the first thing he does, right? This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, for she was taken from Ish. For this reason, it was so good. She was so hot. He was so captivated by her. 
For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. You see a man and a woman, and they become one flesh, both physically in the union of the body parts, insect, but also the two become a third flesh. Two become one. Paige and I are two flesh. We became one flesh in Peyton. So it's a double entendre. We both connect physically to become one, and we also connect physically to become one more. Okay? That's what it means there. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So the two become one flesh. That is a for, for procreation. And the part B of the first part of procreation is that procreation is a bonding agent. Okay? When we have kids, it creates a bond between husband and wife. So it's beneficial both for the... Uh, what's that called? The consistency of our society and the ongoing birth of kids. If we stop having kids, we all perish, right? If there's no more kids, that's the end of humanity. So it's also for procreation, but part of that too is also it's a bonding agent between the husband and the wife. Okay, procreation is a bonding agent. All right, so this is all under the idea of procreation. Right? When Paige gets pregnant, her brain starts kicking out oxytocin, which is a connecting chemical. She has already begun to connect to Peyton nine months before we ever met Peyton. Now, the man can grow oxytocin and become almost addicted to the idea of a kid, but I won't grow a personal connection with Peyton himself until after he's born, which is why they say that women become mothers at conception and men become fathers at birth. So the first time I saw that kid, Everything you can, I physically felt my brain moving. It is like it was firing. It's like after you drink, a, um, like a, like an energy drink, and your brain's like, "Whoa!" That's how it felt the first time I saw Peyton because my whole brain was going, "This is yours. Take care of him." And I was, and as I held him close to my face, I'm starting to connect, and I'm growing an addiction towards this kid. As long as I'm addicted to him, I'm going to protect him. I'm going to provide for him. I'm going to be there for him. And I'm not going to leave. God built it that way for a reason. So it, it's a bonding agent, so it guardrails against divorce. Number two, it's for procreation. Number two, it is for representation. So sex is for procreation, to make more, and to bond two together in the process of making more. And two, it's for representation. By representation, we mean this. In chapter four of Genesis, the very first line says this. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. Now your Bibles might say uh, lay with, it might say made love to, or had sex with, or whatever, but that word is for an intimate knowledge of someone. Adam knew his wife, and the two gave birth to their firstborn, Cain. Okay? It's an intimate knowledge. This is a representation of uh, God knowing us. So the way that we know each other in sex, it says in the, in, the, in the second chapter, right? They were both naked, yet they felt no shame. Okay? So that's the idea. is Before God, He knows everything about me. I have nothing to hide. Okay? I am proverbially naked. Not, you don't be physically naked or whatever. He already knows everything about you. And yet you feel no shame. That's the way that God wants to know us. It's a representation of how God wants to know me. Part of the hang-up that people get really caught up in, especially guys, when you start talking about that God wants to know us, like a man knows a woman, is we think, oh, whoa, God like, se God's like sexual? Like he wants to know me like sex? Here's, here's, a, here's where that gets totally blown out of proportion, is this. I had to write it down because it's really hard to explain. It's not that God wants to know us like a husband knows a wife. It's that God wants to, God wants sex to be a model of how he wants to know us. So God doesn't yearn to know us like a husband knows a wife. He yearns for a husband and a wife to know each other as he knows me. It, one is exemplary of the other. And we always think that God wants to be so close to me, it's like he wants to have sex with me. It's the exact opposite. God wants sex with my wife to be a representation of, whoa, holy cow, I know her better than anyone. And God goes, now you're starting to get how well I know you. It has nothing to do with sexuality whatsoever. Okay? So God is trying to use something that we understand, something that we can relate to and we can participate in, to go, this is how I know you and I want you to know me. 
It's the same way that you know each other so intimately in sex. Okay? So don't get that part backwards. It's not that God wants sexual interaction with us. It's that sexual interaction with one another should be a representation of how much God knows me and I know Him. Okay? So sometimes God has to use human speech, human understandings in order to get across superhuman ideas. Picture this. Uh, I'm going to use this. Okay? This is a piece of paper. It is in basically two dimensions, right? It doesn't really have width. You could argue that microscopically it definitely does. So it's a three-dimensional piece of paper. But picture, this is the world of, this is called flat world. Everything in flat world is two-dimensional. There's a whole civilization of things that are only in two dimensions, okay? So there's no depth. There's just height and width. Right? So this is everything. So imagine we all lived in flat world. We're like, beep, 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 beep. we look at each other and everything, and we, we can see down and around and everything. And then picture this. I am from a three-dimensional world, and I take my ring, and I'm going to pass it through flat world. So everyone's hanging out in flat world one day going, we're flat, we are two-dimensional, we are on a plane, we don't understand anything in the third dimension. And then I take my ring, which is three-dimensional, and I permeate their world. I pass through it just like this. Okay, so this is their flat world and I go And they would look at my ring and guess how they would explain the ring? They would explain it in two dimensions because they wouldn't know how to explain anything else. They'd go, there was like line and there's a line over there. There's only supposed to be a line here and here. There's a line over there. And I, in three dimensional world, would go, no, 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 that's just, it's, it's a ring. It's got three dimensions to it. But not in, in, in 2D world, they'd go, no, 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 you don't get it. There were lines, 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 and then the line stopped. And it went away and it was never seen again. That's how, you would, that's how we are doing it. When God says, here's how I'm going to know you, he goes, ah, you're not going to get it. So I'm going to give you this. And so we in 2D world are going, sex is for this. It is for this purpose. This is how, what it means to know God. And God goes, no, it's so much bigger than that. But I'm going to give you a model a very small, meticulous, not precise model of what it might mean to know me if you understood what I understand. Isaiah is very clear on this in the Bible. It says, my ways are not your ways, nor are my thoughts your thoughts. So when he gives us sex, it is to say, this is not even close to how well I know you, but it's the closest you can get in your two-dimensional world. Okay? Representation. Number three. Recreation. Okay? Procreation, representation, recreation. All right, this is going to get weird. Let's do it. Song of Songs. In your Bibles, if you don't have your Bibles, you can turn to it on your smartphone or whatever. Let's write Song of Songs, uh, chapter 7. Song of Songs, 7. So, Song of Songs is a book that a man and a wife are writing back and forth to each other. Okay? It is not tame. It is not rated G. It is not PG or PG-13 or R. It is idealistically pornographic at least. This is Fifty Shades of Grey for the old Hebrew people. Okay? And when we read it, we're like, what the heck? This guy likes to climb trees? What is it talking about? But in Hebrew thought, this was so perverse in terms of what they would normally talk about, that this was almost one of the books that they didn't want to include because it was so graphic. But this, you tell me when you are listening to this, if this sounds like this guy's enjoying himself or not. Okay? Beginning at verse 1 in chapter 7. How beautiful your sandaled feet. Okay, I, that's not, I don't know, maybe he's a, a guy fetish or something, but um, he's just commenting on how pretty your feet are. O prince's daughter, your graceful legs are like jewels, the work of a craftsman's hand. Your navel is a rounded goblet and never lacks blended wine. Your waist is a mound of wheat encircled by lilies. So, uh, she has a large waist, which he enjoys. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are like pools of Heshbon, the gate of Bath Rabin. She's like, oh yeah, the gate of Bath Rabin, yeah. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. <laughs> your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon looking towards Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. How beautiful you are and how pleasing, O oh love, with your delights. Your stature is like that of a palm tree and your breasts are like clusters of fruit. I said I will climb 
the palm tree and take hold of its fruit. May your breast be like the clusters of the vine and fragrance of your breath like apples in your mouth, like the best wine. May the wine go straight to my lover, flowing gently over lips and teeth. I belong to my lover and her desire is for me. Come, my lover, let's go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards to see if the vines have budded. If their blossoms have opened, if the pomegranates are in bloom, there I give you my love. The mandrakes send out their fragrance, and at the door is every delicacy, both new and old, that I have stored up for you, my lover. And then he's going to continue, and he is going to graphically explain their next sexual encounter, beginning with the foreplay, moving into oral sex, and then ultimately into a culmination into uh, sexual intercourse. Like, this is not, he's not lamenting this, right? He's not like, and then I'm going to climb her tree and grab her fruit, and I'm going to taste of her fruit. That's talking about the female body parts, all of them. All of them. Okay? <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to talk about it without... Uh, using words like vagina and stuff, but there we go. So, but that's what he's talking about. He's going, I have, I have tasted of the fruit and it's delicious. I long to be back there to smell the fragrance of who you are. And at one point she's going to respond and go, I love when you lay naked in between my breasts. It's like putting myrrh on my chest and it's like this perfume. It's like, I love to just breathe it in deep all the night while I sleep. So just laying there naked together. It's, it's pornographic. I mean, it's... Imagine being like a Hebrew boy and coming across this when like your whole life has been all about like staying away from women. You're like, what the frick? Is it in here? Right? It's like, guys will get porn these days. They used to open their Bibles and be like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Mm. So back in the day, they used to have comic books and inside the comic books were their Bible. You know, they're like, oh no, I'm just reading my comic book. Oh, bonds of a gazelle. This is good stuff. Right? So it's gotten, it's definitely changed. So uh, read that. You can read that section when you're taking a cold shower um, so that you're not tempted. All right. Uh, good. Great, great, wonderful. He's enjoying himself. He's having the time of his life. Heck, this guy is writing poetry about the naked body that he is laying on top of. Right? This guy is enjoying himself. And that was what sex was built for, too. Okay? He, God wasn't shocked by the fact that people liked having sex. It was built that way. Second part of recreation. A, for pleasure. B, for relaxation. Or for alleviation. It can bring peace, solace, in the sexual intercourse, through the process of orgasm, for just the guy or for the guy and the girl. The girl can also receive serotonin just from the ejaculation of the man, but it creates serotonin in the brain which calms people down. It reduces stress. It brings people back to level heading. It can relieve pain. It acts as the strongest Advil in the world. It's got healing properties. They're actually practicing things with entanglement right now, which means that they give medicine to one spouse, and if the other spouse is allergic to that medicine, the person who takes it in knows the other person intimately enough that it takes out the poison and then when the orgasm occurs, it gives the other person the medicine that they need. So my body takes out what my wife is allergic to and then gives her what she needs to be healthy. It's built to heal. It is built to bring solace, to bring peace to bring relaxation. In the book of 2 Samuel 2, verse 24, David and Bathsheba have a son. The son dies. It says Bathsheba is so distraught that Adam goes in, lays with her, and then has sex with her, and she feels consoled. It's built for that. The chemical cocktail that takes place in the orgasm is not just for procreation. It also serves other purposes to, to unite, to bring peace to a husband and a wife. Number four, sanctification. Sanctification. Procreation, representation, recreation, sanctification. Okay, what does it mean by sanctification? 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 through 5. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 3 through 5. It talks about this. It says, 
Do you not know that your body is not your own? You were bought at a price. In other words, Jesus Christ on the cross, when he died for us, he bought us. Now, if you're not a believer, none of this applies to you. If you're like, I don't really believe in God, I don't really believe, I don't trust in Jesus for salvation, whatever, then guess what? Your body is your own. And you're like, oh great, I'd rather have my body be my own. But here's the thing. If your body is your own and you die, your sins are also your own. So if you are a believer, we have said, listen, I give you my life, all of it. From the way that I spend my money, to the way that I view success, to the way that I treat people, to the way that I have I use my sexuality. It's all yours. Okay? So if you're a Christian, you ever said the words, my body, my choice, you lie. Not your body, not your choice. It says, but our bodies have become temples of the Holy Spirit. And here's the kicker. We think, oh great, God gets my sexuality. What a boring life. God who got your sexuality invented sex. And he wants us, John 10 verse 10, to have the best sex possible. He's not here to give you this rudimentary, basic, like old English sexuality like, hello, let's make love. Mm, yes, that was great. And we're gone. Right? That's not the way that he built it. He's a God of passion, of fire, of, of jealousy. He's he, all these emotions that are built into sex and these beautiful things. And he, he's not here for us to have this tepid, weird, awkward sex. He's here to give us the best sex possible. And, and here's what I'm trying to get across to you. Is when you give your sexuality to the man who invented it, you will have the best sex possible. When my sexuality is in the hand of the designer, I have always felt my sexuality flourish at its greatest. When I was growing up and I was doing sexuality my own way, no matter what it meant, abusing it in whatever way it was, it was always a thing of shame. I was naked and I felt shame. But his perfect goal is that the man and the woman are naked and they feel no shame. We today can begin to tie sexuality with shamelessness, with beauty, with passion, with love, and not tie it to shame or anything else. Okay? There are very few people who have sexual addictions who are constantly engaging in sex that will report having high satisfactory in their life. They're not one and the same. When we give our sexuality to the man who invented it, he will give us back the best sex life possible. This is not a call for us to abandon passion and abandon joy and abandon eroticism. It's a call to true joy, true sexuality, true eroticism. That is what we're being called to. And finally, the way that it makes us sanctified is it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that in marriage, the man's body is no longer his own. It belongs to his wife. Likewise, the wife belongs to her husband. At any given point, as long as it's not in some really weird situation, I can have sex with Paige whenever I want to. Why is it sanctification? Sanctification because I want to have sex. I'm a guy. She wants to have sex. So if I withhold sex from her, she withholds sex from me, it's not like I stop wanting to have sex. It's, it's likely that that party will begin to look for sex other, where, other places. So it's sanctification in the fact that the more that a husband and wife have sex with each other, the less they're going to want sex from other people. So you see very satisfied sexual couples that you don't even flirt with them. They don't, they don't have time to date for you because they're like, man, I get fed all the time, if you know what I mean. And if you continually feed the cat or the dog, they're not going around the neighborhood to hump other dogs, right? They're going to stay at home. They're like, they're a little kicking back, right? They're like, I don't even, I don't, I'm fine. I'm like, I have more sex weekly than the biggest player in the world. And I'm married. And it's like, what up, dog? Right? That is the kind of sexuality that we are called to in marriage. Okay? It's not once a month. Today is our day. Let us get naked and four minutes tops, right? It's, dang, she is mine and I am hers. And we can just use each other's bodies through this union. And it's not using in the sense of I don't have any other connection to her, but in perfect connection, her body becomes mine and I get to practice sexuality however the frick I want. Okay? That's God's plan. Not that only missionary position, only four minutes. <laughs> he just, this is what God does. He goes, you two are married, I'm going to shut the bedroom door and you guys can enjoy yourselves. I'm going to leave and not come back for however long you need. Okay? That's the God that we serve. He's not sitting there refereeing going, no, no, don't touch that. No, put your mouth there. He's going, 
freaking enjoy it. I made it for you to enjoy it. That is the God that we serve. That is so counterintuitive to what the church teaches, but that is who He is. God that says, you know your first rule? It's not don't eat from that tree. It's go make babies. Go have sex. Go find out how much fun it is. Also, I'm going to write a whole book in the Bible about how erotic this process can be between a man and a woman. That is week one of sex, God. That is the design of sex for sanctification, procreation, recreation, and representation. That is the God that we serve. If you guys have questions, you can always come talk to me. Uh, it, we start small groups back up this week. If you're not in one, make sure that you get in one so we can connect uh, every week and you can hang out in someone's house with a bunch of dudes or girls that uh, can keep us in community. No, no. Guys connect with guys, girls. And when I say connect, I mean, I shouldn't talk about sex there. Yeah. Uh, make sure you guys get signed up for a summer camp. If you have questions, talk to me. If not, we'll see you guys on Wednesday night.